Funding for Shaper Illus is provided by Surfshark VPN. Tune in until the end to find out about their amazing service. Last time on our Star Wars The Clone Wars Retrospective, we watched the movie. It was bad, but it did lead to a really good TV show. I remember being 10 years old and super excited for this show to air. I mean, the idea of getting weekly adventures in the Star Wars universe was just too tantalizing. And I also couldn't tell how terrible the movie was as a kid, so I was even more excited than I probably should have been. So yeah, the show aired and Patrick and I... Hello there! ...tuned in every Friday night on Cartoon Network for every new and exciting episode. <laughs> the show was on Cartoon Network. <sighs> before the dark times before some mouse anyway we all know the clone wars got insanely amazing towards the latter half of its run but the question here was whether or not the first half of the series was quite as good as we remember it being as kids did the show immediately kick it up a notch or was it more kitty shit that's what we're gonna find out if you look through season one today and with that out of the way so long with the preliminaries it's on to the main event Let's jump into Clone Wars Season 1. Season 1 isn't great, but it isn't terrible. I think the best thing I can say about it is that it eventually improves upon some of the biggest problems with the movie, that being Ahsoka's obnoxiousness and immaturity, as well as a lot of the tonal problems. The season definitely starts out with a lot of kiddie feeling episodes, but it generally outgrows them as it goes along, culminating in some genuinely serious feeling stories. It's neat to see. However, overall, this is still definitely the weakest season of the show. That's a pretty good sign for later, but we're not in the later yet, so let's see what we got here. This series starts out right, however, with its very first episode. Ambush follows not any of the main characters from the Clone Wars movie, but instead, we have the rare opportunity to see Yoda on a mission. And it's not that popular of an opinion to enjoy Yoda as a general, but surprisingly, this episode gets Yoda right. He doesn't actively seek out conflict, he prefers to outsmart his enemies using his surroundings, he uses his little size to gain the advantage, and most importantly, he has a very well done heart to heart with the clones and tells them that their lives are more important than they think. It's a little jarring to watch this scene between Yoda and the clones, and then watch the scenes in Revenge of the Sith where he brutally decapitates some of them and murders a ton of others. But fam, let me ask you something. If you had never seen the prequels before and only knew Yoda from the original trilogy, which of these versions of him do you think is more in line with the Yoda we know on Dagobah? Which one feels like this old, wise, understanding, somewhat kooky Jedi Master? This is the first of many instances in the show where I feel like Dave and his team have a better understanding of the Star Wars characters than George did when he was making the prequels. This is the Yoda I want to see based on his characterization in the original trilogy. Overall, this is a simple yet really fun start to the series. I mean, it gives us the king of Watto Planet. Was it that noise? -a? Now, Cartoon Network actually aired the first two episodes back to back back in the day. And the second one isn't quite as good, mainly because it has Ahsoka and she's kind of annoying as usual. But it's also a mission where she and Anakin have to rescue a stranded Plo Koon. Yeah, remember Plo Koon? That guy. Remember how he's Dave Filoni's favorite for some reason? Yeah, presumably because of that fact, he shows up pretty often throughout the series. But it's cool because he has actual characterization now. All the Jedi who previously just showed up in the backgrounds have characterization now. It's a nice change of pace to follow one of them sometimes instead of the designated main characters. I'm personally more of a Kit Fisto guy, so I was really happy to see him get his own episode, but I don't mean any disrespect to Plo Koon. He's very stoic, but he's one of the most caring Jedi despite his demeanor. I really like the main crux of this episode too, with that being the fact that the Separatists have a new weapon at their disposal, the Malevolence. Now with its whole super laser that doesn't even come with a railing, you might think it's another Death Star, but they actually do something new and unique with it, so it's not just a fan service homage. The Malevolence causes a power shutdown on anything it fires at, which creates some of the most tense situations as our characters are left floating in space waiting to be picked off by droids hunting for survivors. It's a pretty neat premise that pays homage to the Death Star without feeling like a ripoff. It's more so like, dare I say it, 
poetry, sort of. They rhyme. Yeah, this episode's a little slow going, but the final sequence where they try and hide by shutting off all the power, only to get sussed out, leading to an epic escape from the purple energy field, it's pretty neat. As a kid watching this episode, though, I was wondering why it ended like this. I mean, this big-ass malevolence ship is now a threat, right? And they didn't even beat it. And then the preview for the next episode started playing. An epic battle against the malevolence. That's when it finally hit me. This is gonna have story arcs. Something I hadn't really seen in a cartoon yet at that point in my life. Hell yeah, I couldn't wait to see next week's episode. Next week's episode was kind of boring. There's not a whole lot to say about this one other than I like the fear in Plo Koon's voice when he realizes they're going through the Balmora run. Ahsoka's more annoying than usual in this episode and it just doesn't feel that exciting to be honest. The next episode, however, hoo boy. Before we get to that, it seems that Matchstick got lit up. What, 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 what are you doing? Oh, um, I was thinking that during this series, whenever a named clone dies, I'm gonna make a bad pun about it. That sounds horrible, I can't wait. Anyway, Destroy Malevolence is awesome. One of the few super early episodes that I still love coming back to. Apparently Palpatine gave Padme some bad coordinates that put her in the middle of this battle with the Malevolence, which isn't sus at all. I'm sure Palpatine just made an oopsie, perfectly normal. Wait, you mean to tell me that Palpatine's a bad guy? No, I said he made an oopsie. Were you even listening? Palpatine is the most trustworthy man I know. Look at his six spins. Could a bad guy do that? Okay, so Padme and 3PO get tractor beam to General Grievous's malevolence ship. So Anakin, Obi-Wan, and R2 gotta rescue them. You know, in hindsight, I think I only like this episode because Ahsoka's barely in it. Anakin and Obi-Wan have such natural chemistry that they never quite had in the prequels. Anakin references spinning being a good trick. What's not to love. I'm a sucker for elaborate rescue missions where all the characters are separated on a big enemy base of some kind and they all gotta find each other and escape together. And this episode delivers that in spades. Also, there are trains for some reason, which makes for some fun action sequences, like the duel between Obi-Wan and Grievous, where we get the possible origins of Hello There. Yes, Grievous apparently originated Hello There. To be honest, they really should have made this a running gag, with them saying hello there to each other each time they meet up in a new episode. It would have made the scene in Revenge of the Sith even funnier. On the topic of Grievous though, there are things about him that are not very much cash money. First of all, it's ridiculous that this show constantly can never have Anakin and Grievous meet up because of that one exchange George wrote in Revenge of the Sith that implies that they are meeting each other for the first time. It's so weird when these are two of the most prominent generals in the war on both sides and yet they never encounter each other once until the very end of the war. But also, Grievous is the one character in this show who is not improved from how they are in the prequels. They're pretty much the same. Just a pretty standard Saturday morning cartoon villain. And that could be fun in its own right, but the Saturday morning cartoon villain concept is done so much better by the set of one-off Separatist leaders we meet later in this season. Grievous, honestly, should have been a much more intimidating presence. Maybe he wouldn't have been on the same level as the awesome Gendy Grievous, but a balance should have been struck. He feels more like a joke in this series than a huge threat most of the time. There's one season 2 episode that does him a lot better, but we'll get to that later. In season 1, he's not that great. Still, it's fun to watch him and Obi-Wan fight each other and the destruction of the malevolence is pretty cash money as well. It's a weirdly dramatic scene where the battle droids are panicking because Anakin set the Navi computer to crash into a nearby moon, and Grievous leaves Dooku on red because he doesn't want to deal with the consequences of losing the malevolence. It's a great ending for a surprisingly good episode. Speaking of things that are good... Rookies. To this day, this is one of the fan favorite episodes, and perhaps the most beloved episode of season 1 as a whole. And yep, I agree entirely. This is a really dramatic and captivating look at a squad of clones with a boring job defending a base that never sees any action. Only to get some action when droids attack. What's really cool is that this is the first time we get to see these clones as actual individuals who just happen to share the same face and voice. They all have their own distinct personalities, however, and it's easy to get invested in each of them. I have 
have a confession that may or may not get my Clone Wars Enjoyer card revoked, but I find it incredibly hard to get invested in individual clones over the course of multiple episodes, since there's a lot of them to keep track of. That's why I prefer individual episodes like this that just focus on a few handful of them, because I love Fives and Echo and Heavy since this episode took the time to focus on them and showcase their personalities, as well as how they all behave as a unit. When they show up in later episodes as just part of a squad Anakin and Obi-Wan is leading, I'm not as excited to see them because it's hard to tell which one is them. But when they're the focus? Yeah, their stories are really special. Heavy's ultimate sacrifice in this episode is a gut punch, since we actually got to know him, something we never would have gotten to do in the prequel movies. This would have just been a nameless, personalityless drone clone. But because it's Heavy, I'm invested. Cut Up didn't invest me nearly as much. I guess you can say, Cut Up got cut up. But yeah, the other death in this episode was really heavy. Wow, that was deep. Anyway, this episode was so good. I hope the next episode is also good. Oh, no. Well, folks, we have reached what I consider to be the absolute worst episode of the entire series. I'm glad we're getting it out of the way six episodes in. It's so bad that it's worse than the Clone Wars movie. Yep. Okay, so downfall of a droid. First of all, the animation is so bizarrely poor in this episode compared to the others that came before it and after it that it's kind of inexplicable. So Anakin loses R2-D2 when his ship gets blown up, so he's really sad, so he looks for him. And then Ahsoka uh, says something like, Hey master, I know that R2 saved our lives multiple times, but f*** him. Let's get this new droid. He's gold. Gold team rules. Might as well get this out of the way, because it's revealed in the next episode that R3 is a spy. I'm the spy. What? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. First of all, how did Grievous get this spy droid to infiltrate the Republic without any of them knowing? And if he can do that, why doesn't this droid just steal the Republic's data and escape, instead of just mildly inconveniencing Anakin and Ahsoka by pretending to screw up tasks and nearly getting them killed? Why does Anakin let what he considers to be a clearly defective droid stay on these missions? Is it because Ahsoka will get sad if he doesn't come with? Grow the f*** up. She's literally more concerned about this idiot droid's feelings than their lives. Also, they visit this disgusting junk dealer who farts on them a lot, and it turns out he found R2 and he just happens to be in contact with General Grievous to sell R2 to him. Again, Grievous has a spy droid that infiltrated the Republic. Why does he even need R2's data? Anyway, this is a two-part arc, and the second part is less bad, but they still formed an extremely bad arc. More of R3 frustratingly screwing up and Ahsoka being like, oh, no, guys, he's doing his best. Like, girl, R3 is so sus right now. You're literally being the second imposter here by vouching for him at the meetings. Fortunately, R2 manages to eject him at the end of the episode, and that's the only good part of this entire two-part arc. It's overly dramatic, but that's what works about it. It's just a funny yet weirdly epic duel between these two rolling trash cans. R2 is kind of badass in this show, not gonna lie, but then again, he's badass in the movies as well. There's also a duel between Ahsoka and Grievous, and it's kind of embarrassing that Grievous can't beat her, but it's mostly a diversion on her part. Whatever, don't watch these episodes, they're terrible. Just watch the fight between R2 and R3 on YouTube, it's funny. I guess that's one other thing I haven't brought up yet. Clone Wars is an anthology series where some episodes don't connect with other ones. Some of them are just completely pointless to the overall story and only exist as a fun little standalone escapade. At the end of these videos, Patrick and I will let you know which episodes you can skip if you want to watch the series and you haven't already. Some episodes can be skipped because they're pretty pointless, others can be skipped because they're pretty bad, Bad, and then there's the ones that are pointless and bad. My favorites. Speaking of bad, guess who just had to be in this show? It's everyone's favorite key to all this, JJ. No, the other one. How do you even mix those two up? We're, it's Jar Jar. We're talking about Jar Jar. It's an episode about Jar Jar. Jar Jar is not on the level of annoyance that he is in the prequels, but that's not a very high bar. I really don't want to talk about Jar Jar, so let's see. This episode also introduces Anaconda. He's going to be a frequent face throughout certain sectors of the show. Gunray's back, and he's honestly pretty entertaining to watch. And I think it's intentional this time. It's kind of funny to watch him mistake Jar Jar for a Jedi Master. Plus the scene where Jar Jar wonders why a Jedi's robe is in Padme's closet, only for 3PO to pretend he doesn't know, is also funny. 
You know Anakin and Padme were getting it on in there. And this episode ends with Newt Gunray getting captured after some wacky hijinks. Followed by Palpatine putting on his best poker face and commending Jar Jar. While inside, he's probably thinking, Oh, come on, we lost to Jar Jar? This is a new low. Yeah, this one hurts. Yeah, this episode is a pretty bizarre arc because it's all about the capture of Newt Gunray, yet each episode in this three-part arc focuses on different protagonists. First, we had Padme and Jar Jar working together to capture him. Now, Luminara and Ahsoka are working to bring him to justice. And finally, we got an episode where Ahsoka is decent. She's not great, but we get to witness her relative inexperience and naivete in ways that don't feel frustrating to watch. It's actually neat to see her grapple with what the right thing to do in this scenario is. Does she guard the Viceroy or help this Jedi Master deal with Ventress? Oh yeah, Ventress is back and she's a lot better than she was in the Clone Wars movie. She has a lot to prove with this mission after that embarrassing f*** up with Jabba's son, and so it's neat to see her pull off this elaborate rescue mission for Newt Gunray. This is a good character character developing episode for both of them, mainly Ahsoka. So Gunray gets away, and episode 10 is about everyone's favorite bro, Kit Fisto, teaming up with his former apprentice to track Gunray down. Little do these Jedi know, they're walking into a trap which is something I guess not all Mon Calamari can sense. Right at the beginning of this episode, we learned that Newt Gunray has been taken to safety by Dooku, but he offers an alternative reward for the Jedi. Ventress had her chance at redemption, and now it's Grievous' turn, as this is the lair of General Grievous, meaning Grievous comes home after a long day of work, only to fall victim to a home invasion. It's actually pretty interesting to see Grievous on the defensive as he gets torn limb from limb by the trap Kit Fisto set up. He manages to escape to get some R&R, leaving the destruction of the intruders to the capable claws of his pet Rancor. With all the tricks and traps of Grievous' lair, the tables are quickly turned on our heroes and a lot of good people are dead. I think Niner has seen finer days. Bell may be rotten in hell, and Commander Philly has been turned into a fillet, but none of these deaths are as sad as the death of Gore. Listen to the broken voice Crevis has as he calls out to Gore in sympathy. <laughs> he truly has lost everything, so at this point, I'm like, yeah, kill Nadar. He's an asshole anyway. Fisto escapes because, you know, he's one of the pre-existing characters who will live to die in another movie. Yeah, Clone Wars unfortunately suffered a bit of a handicap by being a prequel series to Revenge of the Sith. Since we know Anakin, Obi-Wan, Mace Windu, Yoda, Plo Koon, Kit Fisto, Ayla, Sakura, and so on and so forth, can't die since they show up in Revenge of the Sith. That's what makes it cool when the show focuses on new characters, since it's always unpredictable whether they live or die. How the tension is there even for main characters like Ahsoka or Rex. We don't see them in Revenge of the Sith, so maybe they'll die, who knows? Of course, going into the show nowadays, it's obvious they don't since they're used in future Star Wars installments, but at the time? We didn't know, man. The show is incredibly murder happy despite being quote unquote for kids. It kills a lot of characters even here in season 1, and it makes the stakes feel real. We've made it to the halfway point, fam. Seven pages in. You know, we were originally going to do seasons 1, 2, and 3 in this video, but it looks like this is another BoJack situation. Fortunately, unlike William, I don't have a job other than editing these videos, so hopefully they'll come out sooner than the BoJack ones. Hooray! Unemployment! Episode 11 is about Anakin and Obi-Wan attempting to capture Dooku. So now's a good time to bring up Dooku as a character. I think that he's pretty underrated when it comes to the characters people love from this show. Dooku is a very imposing presence. I don't mean to disrespect Christopher Lee, but in the movies, he just seems like some silly old guy. Yeah, I know that's basically what Palpatine is, but that's just it. In Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, Dooku is just Palpatine too, egging his opponents into joining the dark side and not really using his lightsaber in favor of shooting lightning. 
In the Clone Wars, however, Dooku is very serious. Whenever his lackeys get a call from him, you know that they are trembling at the thought of failing him because, well, they're no match for him. He's a Sith Lord. But he's not just a Sith Lord. He's a very hospitable leader on and off the battlefield. He doesn't ever raise his voice that often, and he prefers to talk others into joining him before using the Force. I guess he does the same thing in the movies, but he doesn't have a goofy smile on his face while doing so. He is cruel, cold, calculated, and cunning. But his head is kind of weirdly shaped, so there's that. Anyway, Anakin and Obi-Wan are chasing Count Dracula, but they're too late because he gets captured by a ton of pirates, led by the great Hondo Naka, aka one of the best characters in the entire series. He's been described as the Jack Sparrow of the Star Wars universe, and I think that's an incredibly apt comparison. He's an absolutely kooky and drunken, yet surprisingly competent leader, and he's so much fun to watch. I feel like Palpatine is less embarrassed that a drunken pirate managed to capture Dooku, compared to Jar Jar managing to capture anyone. Either way, the pirates also nab Anakin and Obi-Wan by drugging them, meaning the next episode sees Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Dooku tied together and trying to escape the pirates together. Watching these three duel in the prequel movies, I never could have imagined that they went through this ordeal together. It's so kooky but incredibly fun given all the shade and witty banter they throw at each other. And Hondo is a kooky fun villain! What could possibly ruin this episode? Home, Why did I have to say his name? That probably summoned him. Yeah, Jar Jar's in this episode and it really drags it down. Down. If you want to watch it, just fast forward his scenes. There's literally no reason to watch them. They don't really affect the actual good plotline that much. I mean, it is kind of funny that Anakin and Obi-Wan pretend Jar Jar didn't help them escape. But enough about Binky, our next episode starts not with a space battle, but a sky battle. It doesn't really have any bearing on the plot, it's just a neat aesthetic difference. This episode is about Ahsoka and Ayla Secura getting stranded on an uncharted planet while Anakin is in a coma. I hope he doesn't die! Speaking of death, Flesh lost his flesh, Lucky wasn't so lucky, and Cameron? More like... Damn... Man... You dead. Nailed it. This episode is the first of many in this series to emphasize the negative reality of this war. As our heroes encounter a village of lemurs who fled to this planet to escape the war, causing the Jedi to question if being a soldier really is defending the peace. But early on in this series, I don't think the message is quite that strong because at this point, the only murder the Jedi cause is just cutting down droids. So I think they're the ones acting pretty morally correct in this case because the Separatists are going around causing havoc. So the Jedi just got to stop them. It's pretty black and white at this point in the series. Yeah, I don't know. This lemur elder man just kind of seems unnecessarily stubborn. I mean, the Jedi don't really kill people, except for in those weird live-action fanfics George Lucas made where Mace Windu chopped a guy's head off when he could have easily just disarmed him. So yeah, it's really just droid slicing the Jedi do. What is this guy going on about? Oh well, it's a fine little adventure. In the next episode in this arc, we meet General Lock Dirt of the Separatist Alliance. His voice is so funny, oh my god, it cracks me up. This is a solid episode with a unique threat, and it's nice to see the village pitching in to help the Jedi fight this colonizing asshole. Speaking of colonizing assholes, episode 15 is about one of those. This was always my least favorite episode of season one as a kid, and it's definitely still one of the lesser ones nowadays. It's all about this dick claiming that he owns this moon despite the fact that there are people living on here. I guess it's just kind of Pocahontas in space, but with blue people. Wait a minute. This episode came out January 30th, 2009, and Avatar came out December 18th, 2009. James Cameron, I know what you did! Anyway, this episode ends with the asshole dying, so that's nice. Otherwise, it's predictable and just a lame standalone story you've seen a million times before. Episode 16 is weird because suddenly we're back on Crystalsis, which is where the first part of the Clone Wars movie took place. And Ventress is here, and so is that squid ship that abducted Rada the Hutt, and Ahsoka isn't here. Wait a minute, is this a prequel? Yes, yes it is. This brings us to another really weird aspect of Clone Wars. The episodes aren't in order. I have no idea why this is. I can only assume they thought of little preludes or bookends to some of the stories they already made, and they just went ahead and made them. 
Well, okay. This is a decent prelude to the Clone Wars movie, I guess. Here, we see a clone trooper named Slick betray the Republic and help Ventress, which I found bizarre as a kid. Based on what Attack of the Clones told me, I always assumed the clones were perfect soldiers who never disobeyed orders. But then again, this came from the movie that didn't give the clones personalities. I'm fine with this minor retcon in the series because it makes for such compelling characters. It's interesting to see a clone betray his cause, even though this is what he was bred for. They go further with this concept in a Season 2 episode, but we'll get to that later. Let me just say all the props to D. Bradley Baker for consistently giving every clone a different inflection in their voice despite them all being the same person. It's not an easy feat to make them all sound different, but I think that just shows how talented he is as a voice actor, that he manages to make them all feel like their own separate characters. I can tell that the clone who polishes his weapons is much more timid and orderly based on his voice. This bad boy clone who doesn't play by the rules has a certain gruffness to him compared to his brothers. It's really good stuff. You know what I could use right now? A plot about a killer virus. We don't get nearly enough of those these days. Good thing Clone Wars is here to deliver. This episode is insanely tense, introducing the stereotypical mad doctor who's honestly kind of a blast to watch. He wants to poison Naboo using the infamous Blue Shadow Virus. So it's up to Anakin, Ahsoka, Obi-Wan, Padme, and... <sighs> Jar Jar to stop him. Jar Jar bad, but it's still a really fun intense race against the clock with all these bombs. The episode seems to resolve this plotline pretty well, but uh oh, the virus goes off in the next episode thanks to a little evil droid. How much do you want to bet that this episode's original script had Jar Jar setting off the bomb accidentally? I'm sure that was at least considered before the writers realized that they were going too far in a few places. This episode is also really good, with Anakin and Obi-Wan traveling to the planet that has the angels. Remember the angels? Here's one now. It's very glorious glowy and stuff. They came here to get the cure for the blue shadow virus, but they have a rather unique conflict to deal with when a series of killer lasers prevents anyone from leaving the planet. There's also this boy who reprogrammed a bunch of battle droids that Anakin promptly kills, which is pretty funny. Have I mentioned this show is pretty funny, by the way? The jokes usually land pretty well, if they're not involving Jar Jar or some other annoying side characters. The main characters have great banter with each other, however, plus there's other comedy machines like Hondo or the actual machines, that being the battle droids. Sometimes their jokes are a little tonally out of place, but for the most part, I like that they have a ton of personality as well. They were never going to be a massive threat, so this show smartly turns them into comic relief. Anyway, can you believe it? They saved Padme and Jar Jar. I couldn't believe it because I didn't watch Revenge of the Sith before this. Just kidding, I did. I don't know how they managed to get everyone out without the virus getting airborne, but I guess it doesn't really matter because apparently Obi-Wan and Anakin are vaccinated. Anakin is certainly much more quick to anger in this episode because his Padawan and lover's lives are on the line, but I honestly think he was a little too chill considering that. This show is very smart with Anakin becoming more and more unstable as the series goes on, so it makes sense for him at the beginning of the series to not completely lose his cool yet. Episode 19 is the start of a three-part arc all about the Siege of Ryloth, as the Jedi attempt to liberate the Twi'lek people. Starting with the Separatist blockade, Ahsoka is put in command of a mission for the first time and she gets her entire squad destroyed. Guess Axe got the axe. This of course weighs heavily on her, and it's because of this guilt and retrospection that this is the first episode where Ahsoka feels like a great character. Not just tolerable or inoffensive like she was in the Jedi Crash arc or the Blue Shadow Virus arc, or mildly good like she was in the episode with Luminara and Ventress, but a really strong, well-written character. For the first time, we get to see her really grapple with the consequences of her mistake and heavily consider the true price of war. Her actions and not listening to her commanders have consequences, and she has to deal with the consequences. It's pretty heavy stuff for a Padawan learner, even one as capable as she is. And it contributed to a really compelling story where she wasn't sure if she could trust her own judgment in battle. Anakin's continued faith in her, however, is really inspiring, and her unorthodox tactics managed to win the day and redeem her previous failures. That and Anakin's brilliant gambit of using his ship as a battering ram against a giant space donut. 
Overall, this is an incredibly strong episode, probably my favorite of the entire season, right up there with Destroy Malevolence and Rookies. Honestly though, this Ryloth arc kinda peaks in the beginning and gradually gets weaker as it goes. Not to say that this second episode is bad, not at all, it's still really good, focusing on two clones named Waxer and Boyle who find this young Twi'lek girl all alone while on a scouting mission. This ties into what I said earlier about Rookies. I get really invested in Clone Trooper's stories when an episode focuses on a few of them, and it's no different here. This little girl is the perfect representation of the innocence of Ryloth, and her presence does wonders in getting us invested in this conflict. There's some solid action and suspense featuring Obi-Wan and his troops, and the ending of this episode is just really heartwarming. The finale of Ryloth is definitely inferior compared to the previous two episodes. First thing wrong with it is the Jedi involved is Mace Windu, who is still kind of a boring asshole just like he is in the prequels. I guess that's another character they didn't really fix in this show. This episode is mainly about fixing the relationship between the Ryloth Freedom Fighters leader and the Twi'lek Senator Orn Free Ta. But do we really want to see the two of these guys make amends? I mean, Orn Free Ta is kind of a class traitor. Look at him, living it up on Coruscant with his big belly and his harem, while the rest of his people have to scrape by during the Separatist occupation. And then the Separatist leader for this episode is Wat Tambor, and he is kind of a dumb. The only good thing about him is this scene in Attack of the Clones where he had a moment. I guess it's kind of funny that he gets left behind because he was too carried away with hoarding treasures like the Ark of the Covenant, but that makes it so that he is a less intimidating presence than the two villains that were under him in the previous two episodes. And one of them was just a generic droid. So yeah, this episode is kind of meh. You can just pretend that the ending of the last episode meant Ryloth was saved. Hooray! And now we come to the season finale. Hostage Crisis. Some bounty hunter named Cad Bane takes control of the Senate building and holds senators for ransom unless Palpatine frees Zero the Hut. Yeah, remember Zero from the movie? Apparently we weren't done with him, and thank God for that because this moment happens. Oh, it's so bright! Out here. Oh my god. I don't know why, but that clone saying, oh my god, is just so hysterical to me. Anyway, on the same day Cad Bane is pulling these shenanigans, Anakin is on vacation and he's chilling at Padme's office. He gives her his lightsaber to prove his devotion to her, and probably for sexual reasons, but unfortunately, that means he doesn't have it when the Senate building goes on lockdown. Speaking of which, that's another thing there aren't nearly enough stories about. Lunatics storming the Senate building. Thank god Clone Wars has got us covered there as well. Now, as a kid, I thought this was the coolest episode ever, and Cad Bane was the coolest guy ever. Well, the latter thing is probably still true. I mean, this plan is just so badass and well thought out, and it cements this guy as an awesome villain. But nowadays, I feel like this episode is held back by Anakin's sheer incompetence when he doesn't have his lightsaber. I just don't find it realistic at all that he can't beat these bounty hunters despite having the Force. Like, the Force can do a lot of things, and if he really needs a weapon, he can just use the force to grab a blaster from them. So yeah, that's really distracting and weird, but aside from that, this is a really cool episode and season finale. I imagine Palpatine would just have loved to use the force to break himself out of his prison, but Onfri Ta, or as we like to call him, T-Money, just had to show off in his office right on cue like it's a sitcom, and the two of them are stuck together. Palpatine is in a rare moment of helplessness, and there's something so cathartic about someone outsmarting smarting Palpatine. While we know he's a Sith Lord mastermind, he still has to keep that on the down low and act all Chancellor-y, which makes it neat to see other characters get the upper hand over him, even though they don't know that they're dealing with a Sith Lord. It's a really fun shift in the usual power dynamics, and there wouldn't have been any other bounty hunter more capable of pulling off such an elaborate plan than Cad Bane. He is definitely the best original villain to come out of this show, and did Disney needs to put him in more things. Like, seriously, how has he not shown up in The Mandalorian? He would fit right in. And so would Hondo. Make it happen, Disney. So yeah, that's season one of The Clone Wars. Kind of a mixed bag for sure. A lot of episodes still feel very geared towards kids, but there are plenty of signs of maturity and evolution for the series here and there. I think the biggest takeaway is that most of the episodes, most of them, are a lot better than the movie, which was really just an awful first impression. But yeah, for the most part, 
part, the animation is improved and to this day looks really good for a 3D animated TV show from 2008. The action looks pretty solid and fluid, and the characters just get better as the season goes on. Ahsoka has some tangible development here, and by the end of this rewatch, I remembered exactly what made her one of my favorite Star Wars characters, even if her best episodes are still yet to come. Anakin is an incredibly enjoyable protagonist now, and his banter with Ahsoka, and especially Obi-Wan, is a delight. The clones and the previously background Jedi feel like actual characters now. There's a ton of great new characters. Yeah, overall, it's not a bad season, despite some of its tonal flaws and excess of Jar Jar, who even then isn't nearly as bad as he is in The Phantom Menace. Every time we do a collab, he says everything I could possibly say in the conclusion, and then I have nothing to add. Clone Wars, good. Good call, my young Padawan. However, you do get the honors of saying which episodes our loyal fanbase at home should watch from this season, and which ones they can skip. Since Clone Wars has the benefit of not forcing its viewers to watch every single episode in order to experience its story. Take it away. Oh boy! All right, Ambush is a must watch. Not so much because it's important to the overall story, but because it's a nice wholesome introduction to the overall tone of this series. And it's one of the only times Yoda gets focused on in the entire series. The Malevolence arc is solid overall with just a weak middle. It's not a must watch, but there's still a lot to enjoy here. Here. Rookies, you absolutely must watch. Not only does it flesh out the clones, but the stories of Fives and Echo are very important in the future. Skip Droid Arc. Maybe just watch the R3 and R2 fight on YouTube. The Gunray Arc is interesting because it's very loosely connected, so don't bother watching the Jar Jar one if you don't want to. The Ahsoka and Kit Fisto ones are pretty cool though. Likewise, the Dooku Captured Arc is pretty solid, as long as you fast forward the Jar Jar scenes in the second episode. Or watch them, I don't care. Either way, at least watch the first part, because you get to meet Hondo! The Lemur Village two-part arc is unnecessary, but decent. Skip the snowy Avatar episode, there's nothing important in it. Maybe watch the Traitor Clone episode? It is an entertaining one, but you don't have to watch the movie afterwards. The Blue Shadow Virus arc is unnecessary, but we still enjoyed it. Still, you might not be in the mood for it right now, so it's totally skippable. The first two episodes of the Ryloth arc are pretty significant, you should definitely watch them. The third, not so much. And the season finale is definitely very important to check out, plus it's very entertaining. See you next time for season two. It can only go up from here. May the force be with you. And tell me if I missed any named clones in the comments. We'll get them next time. I'll tell you what you missed. While you were saying which episodes the people at home should watch, R3 showed back up and stole all of our private data! Oh no! He actually did something competent! If only there was a way to protect our private data so that this never happens again. Oh wait, there is. You can use Surfshark VPN, an incredible product that encrypts your data and protects you online. Surfshark VPN allows you to access geo-restricted content, meaning you can trick your browser into thinking you're in another country, thus allowing you to access content you couldn't get otherwise. That way, you don't have to physically travel to another country to watch that country's exclusive Netflix content, for example. You can also use Surfshark and its Surfshark alert system to get alerts anytime your email address or password is compromised. Surfshark alert scans various databases of leaked information and notifications its users if their data is found so they can take action, which is an absolutely invaluable feature. Surfshark is also totally unlimited, meaning you can use it on as many devices as you like, even all at the same time. No other VPN allows this. Go to surfshark.deal slash realist and enter promo code realist to get 83% off and one extra month of Surfshark VPN for free. It's an amazing deal, and it's even better because it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're not satisfied, you can cancel during those 30 days and get your money back. Once again, head to surfshark.deal slash realist and enter the promo code realist. Have a great time with Surfshark VPN.